so um, hello again. I'm very happy to um, uh, introduce the first uh, keynote of uh, this conference. <coughs> uh, Professor Mark Morrison needs no introduction, but the ritual requires that I should introduce him nonetheless. <laughs> so he's a professor and head of, of the English department at Penn State University. He's the author of books, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. One of them is actually here, The Public Face of Modernism, Little Magazines, Audiences and Reception, 1905-1920, which came out in 2001. Modern Alchemy, Occultism, and the Emergence of Atomic Theory, 2007. And more recently, Modernism, Science, and Technology, which was published in 2016. He's also the co-editor with Richard, Richard Chilito of I Saw Water, an occult novel and other selected writings by Eiffel Cahoon, which came out in 2014, and with Jack Seltzer, co-editor of an edition of the Parisian little magazine Tambour. He's also past editor of the Penn State University Press series Refiguring Modernism, Arts, Literature, Sciences, past co-editor with Sean Latham of the Journal of Modern Periodical Studies, also one of the founders of the Modern Studies Associations, um, and returned to its board as president more recently. I will stop there, it's already quite a lot. Um, so he's going to talk to us uh, today about the very reason for this conference, right? Why turn to the big magazines, American Modernism, and the rise of periodical studies. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, everybody, for, for uh, coming to this conference. And thanks especially to Anne and Cecile and Frank for all the work of putting this together, because it's um, even a conference that's not a massive thing like the MSA can take a massive amount of time uh, to put together. And it's, it's all running smoothly because you've devoted that time and energy to it. Um, I've missed my opportunity to publicly thank the, the consulate in Marseille, but um, I appreciate their, their willingness to support this, as well as, of course, um, ex-Marseille University, who has uh, made this possible, and all the, the different um, groups within that who have contributed to the conference. So um, let, me, let me say, actually, before I get started on this, that I think in a way what I'm about to say has already just been presented in front of me by the papers today, because this is, uh, you've seen several examples already of, of very different kinds of work that really make the case for shifting somewhat the way we're thinking about modernism and periodicals. And so I'm going to give a little, I guess a little bit of a prehistory to that, and then end with some thoughts that I think the room is already thinking, judging by, by the papers today. Um, so... Uh, as we approach the uh, modernism through the lens of, of big magazines, um, I want to rehearse briefly this, the history of the scholarship on modernism in, um, in magazines, little and big, um, and then venture some thoughts on, on the impact of periodical studies and also of digitalization and all the, the, the many kinds of projects that it's now possible to do that weren't possible to do 10, 15 years ago even. Um, and the scholarship on modernism in magazines actually began within about 20 years of when modernist little magazines began. Um, so you know, going back to around 1930 um, or so, and it happened very, very quickly. But it was um, they were under the little magazines were understood largely as a print medium um, by which modernism could could maintain a critical distance from the market, and I think that was a mistake built into the scholarship from the beginning that we've um, kind of paid the price for until maybe 15, 20 years ago. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how how I think that came about. Um, but in so in more recent years, scholarly attention has has turned uh, clearly to the role of modernism as a component of the same market culture that the little magazines were supposed to have been evading. Which I, you know, again, I, I have a bone to pick with that. Um, but the the impact also on, of uh, technological modernization on print culture, I think, has has also become a, an issue for many of us in our in our research, and we've already seen in in papers um, here today. Um, so I, th I think the ultimately where I want to leave us by the end of this is a question of how much does the term modernism matter to us now? Um, and for somebody who's stayed virtually my entire scholarly career on modernist studies, I have to say I'm beginning to have some, some doubts about it. So I can go through my crisis of faith in front of you here. So, okay, so um, in 1946, uh, this book was published. And this, this is probably something you have all 
seen or run across or, or used or referred to in some way or another. Um, and it was, uh, Frederick Hoffman was an assistant professor of English at Ohio State really early in his career. Um, Charles Allen was an assistant professor of English at Arizona, University of Arizona. And the real, I think, hero of this edition was Carolyn Ulrich, who actually died shortly after it was published. But she was the, she had recently retired as the, um, the chief of the periodicals division of the New York Public Library. The bibliography really is hers. Um, and she actually worked hard to get more magazines into it. She wanted a couple hundred more magazines put into it than, than ultimately the others decided should go in there. Um, but I want to start, with, in a way, I, I think, I guess I'm going to lay some of my grouse with the book of Frederick Kaufman um, because he, he previewed an argument of this book actually a few years earlier that makes more or less the same claims that the book does. So this is, um, I have some longer quotations that I'm just going to put up on slides in case anybody feels like reading along. But, um, so this is the way the, the author has decided to define little magazines. Um, a little magazine is a magazine designed to print artistic work which for reasons of commercial expediency is not acceptable to the money-minded periodicals or presses. Little magazines are willing to lose money, to court ridicule, to ignore public taste, willing to do almost anything, steal, beg, or undress in public, rather than sacrifice the right to print good material, especially if it comes from the pen of an unknown Faulkner or Hemingway. Such periodicals are therefore non-commercial by intent, for their altruistic ideal usually rules out the hope of financial profit. Um, they were... Hoffman, especially, I think, was influenced by um, an article, an essay on small magazines. It was published in 1930 in the NCTE's journal. It was, it, was, uh, it was called the English Journal at the time. It's now called College English. I'm sure you all have run across this. By none other than Ezra Pound, which is a, an odd place for Ezra Pound to have been publishing. Nevertheless, there it was. Um, and so Pound... This, this is what Pound had to say about, he didn't, doesn't use the, word, the phrase little magazines, he called them small magazines, fugitive magazines, a number of other phrases. But he's talking about what Frederick Hoffman means by little magazines. Um, the last 20 years have seen the principle of the free magazine or the impractical or fugitive magazine definitely established. And of course, what Pound doesn't even need to mention is that he was in part, you know, the person who helped establish this in the Anglophone world, at least. It's attained its recognized right to exist by reason of work performed. The commercial magazines have been content and are still more than content to take derivative products 10 or 20 years after the germ has appeared in the free magazines. Work is acceptable to the public when its underlying ideas have been accepted. The heavier the overhead in a publishing business, the less that business can afford to deal and experiment. This purely sordid and eminently practical consideration will obviously affect all magazines, save those that are either subsidized, as chemical research is subsidized, or else very cheaply produced, as the penniless inventor produces in his barn or his attic. Um, Pound seems to be very fond of these, these very strange mad scientists in the attic metaphors. Um, Though it's hard to imagine Harriet Monroe, Margaret Anderson, or even, quite frankly, Ezra Pound having been willing to undress in public to support their magazines, um, as Hoffman, Allen, and Ulrich had humorously suggested, this heroic understanding of little magazines is altruistically dedicated to high-quality writing at the expense of commercial success, and even of a sizable audience, remains commonly accepted even in the 21st century. Um, in Little Magazine Profiles, Little Magazines in Great Britain, 1939 to 93, Wolfgang Groschacher reinforces that understanding. Quote, editors disdain any aspirations for the magazine to become more than a publication for those few with a commitment towards poetry and its most important means of publication. And this, this foundational understanding is reiterated even in, in uh, um, some very interesting work that have traced the shift into the digital media of, um, of little magazines. Um, the little magazine in contemporary America, edited by Ian Morris and Joanne Diaz. Do you guys know this volume? It's, track it down if, if you haven't. It's, it's worth reading. So while tracing the little magazine through the mimeograph age, um, the period of competition for university periodicals, and now from the internet, the internet, the editors note that, quote, penury is integral to the definition of the little magazine. The editors of these magazines would all agree that making money has never been a primary goal. So that just came out a few years ago. I'll set aside for a moment a critique of Hoff and Allen and Ulrich's central assertion of little magazines as anti-commercial and anti-mass audience to instead make a different point that I think is the more crucial one for this symposium. 
Hoffman Allen Ulrich's example of the kind of high quality writing that the heroic little magazine editor can identify and publish is clearly modernism, an unknown Faulkner or Hemingway, and in a, a different piece, he uses Joyce as an example. Joyce had already died, but nevertheless. Um, but by 1946, Hemingway and Faulkner, as quintessential American modernist fiction writers, were publishing in a very different kind of magazine, one that we'll call for this conference, Big Magazine, the Big Magazine. Um, Hemingway, for instance, had published in Esquire, Scribner's, and Cosmopolitan, um, while Faulkner, though he had certainly struggled longer to get into the six, um, had already been publishing stories in the Saturday Evening Post, which I now have a, a very different sense of what Faulkner's stories might have been doing in the Saturday Evening Post. Um, Moreover, in 1943, Frederick Hoffman had previewed the argument of the 1946 Little Magazines volume in a decidedly commercial magazine, the Saturday Review of Literature, which even during the Lean War years achieved an average pay circulation nearing 24,000. Uh, to put that in context, so Esquire that year had averaged almost 700,000 in pay circulation, while Cosmopolitan was, uh, was still well over the 2 million mark. Um, I don't even know where the Saturday Evening Post would have been during the war, but it would be massive, I'm, even higher, yeah. Um, you know, poetry was plugging along at 2,900, which is actually not bad for, for that. But, um, so in, in the, the little magazine, Portrait of an Age, which was Hoffman's piece in the Saturday Review, um, he tracked three periods in terms of the little magazine. So 1912 to 1930, um, he characterized by its advanced guard literature, philosophical interests, and uh, psychoanalytic preoccupations. Um, and so his examples are Little Review, Poetry, Blast, and the Egoist magazines you're all familiar with. The 1930s uh, Little Magazines, he cites, focus on proletarian literature and reportage, um, the Anvil, Fred Miller's Blast, not to be confused with Wyndham Lewis's Blast, um, the Partisan Review, and then um, on the, what, he called, what he picked up as the Night Mind and Surrealism and in Joyce's work in progress um, that was being published in Transition. Um, and then the current period, the early 1940s, uh, witnesses the birth of new little magazines, some of which he trots out but doesn't really know what to say about them yet because it's only 1943. So he seems to have a kind of decadal sense of, of the progression of little magazines. Um, but he, can con he concludes, quote, one fact that would seem needs no further emphasis. The little magazine, because of the nature of its beginnings and because of its comparative freedom from the restraining influence of its conservative fellows, accommodated itself to the search for values and to the experiments with form, which must be considered the principal contributions of the early 20th century to literary history, which is actually pretty much the argument of, of the Hoffman Allen Ulrich book. Without using the word modernism, Hoffman had clearly folded into magazine history some assumptions about literary value and literary production. Aesthetic experimentation was privileged and assumed to exist against the conservative forces of the literary market. And perhaps most importantly, and with absolutely no self-awareness that he had done so, he confirmed a historiography of modernism that would for years understand the achievements of the age as emerging primarily outside the circuits of the market of mass readership and of technological modernization that produced that market. This argument about the heroic experimentalist turning his or her back on mass audiences in the name of quality and innovation not only ignores the extent to which his examples, Faulkner, Hemingway, and Joyce, for instance, had moved into much broader literary celebrity by 1943, but also ignores the extent to which these authors, even early in their careers, sought the affirmation and commercial rewards of the broader periodical culture of the day, as well as the more established uh, book publishing houses. It was a remarkable turn to have made. Even Pound, in Studies in Contemporary Mentality, which is a, a series of articles that were being published in the New Age in 1917, 1918, which you should all read if you haven't, um, had emphasized how much can be learned about, uh, about the modernity of his age by looking at the broader range of periodicals. Um, and there was the, the Small Magazine's article was Pound making a, an intervention in a very specific and narrow thing that he actually understood much more capaciously than, than that would suggest. Um, and so those, those articles recently led um, Bob Scholes and Cliff Wolfman to, uh, um, in Modernism in Magazines, an introduction to Style Pound as the founder of modern periodical studies, which is, you know, it's, it's an interesting gesture. Um, but in spite of the limitations of Hoffman's heroic narrative, little magazines could create the enduring contributions of early 20th century culture more or less on their own, and quite frankly, the nebulousness of his category, Little Magazine. Um, his work in a major bibliography, 
that would be published in 1946, um, would, would move scholarship away from simply looking into magazines as a place you can find lost or missing poems or essays um, or stories that had not been reprinted, um, and instead to see them as objects of study in and of themselves. So that's a, a major shift, I think, that would have been puzzling if someone had tried to make that argument um, 20 years earlier than that, certainly. Um, by the late 1950s, modernism had been fairly definitively enshrined in American universities as the literature of the first half of the 20th century, and had been validated outside the academy by the awarding of key prizes to its by then star authors. Yates had won the Nobel Prize earlier in the century, 1923, and Thomas Mann received his in 1929, but the late 1940s and 1950s marked a turning point for American modernist authors. T.S. Eliot, though he would, had been a Brit since what, 1927, something like that, uh, won the Nobel in 1948, followed by William Faulkner in 1949, Ernest Hemingway in 1954. Um, and during that same period, Ezra Pound, while still incarcerated in the same rules of this, controversially won the Bellingham Prize for poetry in 1949, followed by Wells Stevens in 1950, Marianne Moore in 1952, William Carlos Williams in 1953, um, Auden, who had been an American since 1946, won the Bellingham in 1954, and E.E. E. Cummings in 1958. So that's a, that's a, a decade-long run of, of largely modernist um, poets. Well, and perhaps because these authors have been validated by the institutions of literary evaluation in the U.S. Uh, during the 1940s and 50s, the little magazines in which they had gotten their starts, or with which they were heavily involved early in the century, then became the focus of periodical research in modernist literary scholarship. So now the, the Egoist and Little Review and all those magazines are, are the place to turn because these are the authors to be studied. So I, I think there's a real tie-in with the university expansion, which, in fact, um, coincides with the GI Bill. Um, in Amer American universities, um, this basically subsidized, in many ways, the education of returning soldiers after World War II and greatly expanded um, the university system in, in the United States, at least the public version of it. Um, so the bibliographic tool that Hoffman, Allen, and Ulrich provided scholars in 1946 was accompan accompanied by a rapid expansion of the professoriate in American universities um, and was also connected to another important phenomenon, which was the, wi the widespread reprinting of modernist little magazines um, in the 1950s. And this is uh, Viennese immigre Peter Krauss. Um, you've all run across Krauss reprints, I'm sure. Started in the 1940s. Uh, he started Krauss periodicals in 1946 to, to look for, track down back issues and, and largely complete runs of a lot of, uh, a lot of little magazines because he knew American research libraries, American universities were going to want these things. Um, and so that becomes Krauss reprint in 1957. Um, Frank Cass in Britain is doing a similar thing, though not on the same scale. Um, you see a later version of that in the 80s with Black Sparrow. Bringing, bringing these things into print, knowing that university libraries are going to buy them. You know, Black Sparrow even got course adoptions for a lot of, I think Blass has been taught in a lot of uh, undergraduate courses too. Um, but so, so the microfilming of those same periodicals had already begun in the mid-1930s. So they're available, although what's available, you know, largely the ads are all stripped out. It's, it's, this has been a long, for anybody looking at advertising in a periodical, it's, it's vexing how little of it exists in reprints of magazines. Um, but the confluence of more readily available reprint runs of little magazines in American university libraries, the fairly well-funded expansion of professorships in English departments in both the U.S. and in Britain, uh, and the academic prestige of modernist literature in the United States, um, as well as in Britain, uh, produced a wave of serious histories of little magazines and their editors. Um, a few examples, these are books you've probably all run across somewhere in your studies. Um, Wells Martin's The New Age Under a Raj, uh, Joy Grant's Harold Monroe in the Poetry Bookshop, um, Bernard J. Poley's Format Transatlantic Review, Nicholas Juice, Schofield Thayer in the Dial, um, Years of Transition in the Dial. Um, these were all published in 1964 and 1967. Um, Joan Wittendale and Mary Nick Nicholson's Dear Miss Weaver, uh, Harriet Shaw Weaver, 1876 to 1961, is ostensibly a biography of Harriet Shaw Weaver, but it's very much a a history of the egoist as well. Um, 
and the academic jobs were starting to dry up somewhat by the early 70s, but that's, that style of monograph um, continued for a while into the 70s. So like um, Ellen Williams, Harry Monroe in the Poetry Renaissance, the first 10 years of poetry, 1912 to 22, was published in 1977. Although I believe she never found an academic job, so there's already beginning to be the, the there are many more people trying to get academic jobs than there are jobs. Um, Okay, so I, I've included some subheadings here just so I don't uh, um, lose you completely. In those. Um, okay, so while focusing on the periodicals and their editors, and in many ways putting editors such as Harriet Monroe, Margaret Anderson, Schofield Thayer, and Harriet Shaw Weaver on the modernist map as important figures in the genesis of modern literature in ways that would lead, uh, lead the way for work on like Dora Marsden, Jane Heap, other editors later. But the earlier period that, that I just outlined, this work in the 60s, um, was primarily still decidedly biocritical in focus and tended to persist in not addressing the, the broader market forces of the modernist era uh, and of its periodical culture. And it took, it really wasn't until I'd, I'd say the 1990s, kind of the mid 1990s and 2000s, that um, modernism itself began to undergo a major reconceptualization. And the little magazine became crucial again, but in very different ways and sort of revisionist histories. Um, the so-called new modernist studies emerged out of a, a renewed focus on, on modernism's parent or twin or, or strange relative um, modernity. You know, there's the modernity in a very particular moment of technological modernization um, got a lot of focus that it had largely just been assumed as the background for modernism before. Um, and I think that 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 focus and brought a new interest in literary markets and the larger promotional and market culture of the West um, in Habermas's public sphere theory and the, all the work challenging it and positing um, alternative or counter public spheres. Um, work on print culture, material history, um, crept into modern studies, producing arguments about distinction, various forms of, of social and cultural capital, um, moved beyond the kind of traditionally economic capital that people have talked about. And so then we start seeing um, books by uh, Jennifer Witt, Kevin Detmar, um, Stephen Watt, Aaron Jaffe, a little bit later, about um, we theorizing the relationship between modernism and mass culture and exploring the, the celebrity culture of modernist writers um, in, and of, in and of themselves. So, so like Joyce and Stein become newly interesting for this later period after their deaths in many ways, or even, even late in their, their lives in the 30s. Um, and so, so that, that earlier generation's sense of high modernism is antithetical to mass culture breaks down. Um, the, the more it gets pushed on, the, the more it, it, it falls apart. And the high-low divide gets deconstructed much more rigorously by, by the 90s. Um, and it, it gives um, little magazines, editorial theory gives little magazines a, a new focus, the scholarship a new focus as well. Uh, Jerry McGann and George Bornstein's distinctions between linguistic code, and there's the words that might get put into an anthology later, versus bibliographic code typography, layout, the surrounding text, uh, font choices, uh, publication genres, all those other things. Bibliographic code becomes the, 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 the focus in many ways of, of that same period. Um, and that research then challenges Hoffman, Allen, and Ulrich's definitional assumptions that they, that little magazines existed against or at least isolated from mass audiences and market considerations. Um, so while little magazines were not always successful in achieving wider readerships and influence on the literary market, um, my own work sitting on the table basically looks at all the, the efforts to try, to try, in fact, to accomplish both of those things, even if they, they didn't always um, succeed. But, but very much a sense of little magazines, even if they didn't become mass magazines, as having been quite self-consciously aware of their relationship to that broader periodical culture and to the, the, the various promotional strategies involved in it, um, challenges somewhat that anti-audience rhetoric that then begins looking more like a promotional strategy in and of itself. Um, but so I, I think the big shift, though, and, and this is not just in work on little magazines, but is in the understanding of modernism as a, as a much broader phenomenon in relationship to, to market capitalism. And the, that shift, um, well, 
one early version of this that you've probably all seen in some way or another is, uh, is Larry Rainey's 1998 monograph, Institutions of Modernism, Literary Elites and Public Culture, um, in which he takes aim at decades of the prevailing orthodoxy about modernism and commodity capitalism. Um, this is a quote from Rainey. Modernism is commonly considered a strategy whereby the works of art resist commodification, uh, holds out by the skin of its teeth against the loss of aesthetic autonomy. But it may be that just the opposite would be a more accu accurate account, that modernism, among other things, is a strategy whereby the work of art invites and solicits its commodification. Um, you know, Rainey's a contrarian, but, but this, was a, this was a provocative argument, and of course, knowing his work laid out in, in, in great detail. Um, and so his, his research was most notable, perhaps, for the account of the commodification of um, and the collecting and patronage strategies around the publication of Ulysses. I think that got, got the most press. So there was a, a tripartite strategy where um, Ulysses is serialized in a prestigious but small circulation, little magazine, little review in the US, The Egoist in Britain, um, followed by publication of a heavily patronized um, limited edition that's aimed directly at the collector's market, so Sylvia Beach's Shakespeare and Company edition, and it followed eventually by, by an edition for a broader reading audience, so Harriet Shaw Weaver's Egoist Press edition. And then, of course, after the Woolsey decision, um, the, the Random House edition in the United States was, was the, the real payoff there. Um, but what, what made Rainey's archival materials account so controversial for many was that it not only eschewed critical close reading of the text itself, but argued that the market strategy by which Ulysses and other modernist texts rocketed to centrality in the modernist canon was scarcely about reading at all. As he puts it, uh, Beach's edition was directed primarily towards dealers, towards speculators. The reason to buy a book published by Weaver was to read it. The reason to buy the edition proposed by Beach was quite different, to be able to sell it again, perhaps at a significant profit if all went well. Here is the final and consummate paradox of modernism. Though we tend to associate modernism with the emergence of the new criticism and the triumph of close reading, the effect of modernism was not so much to encourage reading as to render it superfluous. Now, of course, that that's works very well for what Sylvia Beach was doing with Ulysses. It's, it's hardly a claim that could be made of modernism writ large. Um, nevertheless, a, a, a bold claim. So seven years after the publication of Rainey's monograph, um, Aaron Jaffe, in his own perceptive argument about modernist celebrity culture, um, responded to the extreme negative response that Rainey's argument got by saying, quote, the presumed offense boils down to this. Modernist culture is ordinary. We arrive at the unthinkable formulation. Modernist cultural production is, in fact, cultural production. I think it hardly needs to be said now, but, but saying what Rainey was saying in the 90s and what Aaron Jaffe was saying you know, a, a decade or so ago um, actually did feel kind of controversial at the time, but I think, I think less so now. That doesn't feel like that undermines the, the value of modernist literature in a way that it seemed like it was saying at the time. Um, so at the beginning of the 21st century, this major turn in modernist studies was essentially accomplished. Rather than continuing the dominant 20th century academic account of modernism as positioned against the taint of the market and of mass culture, uh, the kind of account that had been instantiated in the heroic narratives of little magazine publication, um, and even confirmed in the not so heroic high modernism in the work of scholars such as Andreas Husen, um, scholars were beginning to make uh, arguments about how profoundly modernism engaged with the market economy and promotional culture of the 20th century, and indeed how modernist and even avant-garde was the market culture of that time and of our own. The most trenchant in such accounts was John Cooper's Modernism in the Culture of Market Society in 2004, in which he made the, the bold claim, quote, I take what literary and um, visual arts historians call modernism to be the intrinsic culture of market society. And there is our market culture now, that's what modernism gave us. That, that's what it is. Um, it's, you have to read the whole book to decide whether you think that's, that's right on the money or... Okay. As much as these arguments about modernism and market culture are focused well beyond periodicals, the print culture of the modernist era in many respects coincided fairly closely with the rise of modern periodicals to a transformative prominence now enjoyed by digital media in our own times. Indeed, while the book and art collector markets are key to Rainey's argument, periodicals necessarily play a major role. 
He argues that, quote, by 1922, literary modernism desperately required a financial critical success that would seem comparable to the stunning achievement of modernist painting. Yet every step in this direction was hampered by market constraints. There's modernist painting has a, a patronage and a collecting system that Ulysses sort of plugged into, but it's not a reproducible thing. So what, what modernism needed was a, was a, a commercial market success story. Um, Patronage, Rainey continues, could nurture literary modernism only to the threshold of its confrontation with the wider public. Beyond that point, it would require commercial success to ratify its viability as a significant idiom. That was the question that permeated discussion about publication of the wasteland. Now, the, again, the, the Ulysses argument, I think, is a chapter out of Rainey's book that's gotten the most press, but the wasteland argument actually is most relevant to what we're talking about in, in this conference. Um, and so, so he offers an insightful and influential account of the publication choices and strategies around that highest of high modernism's icons, the wasteland, um, and lays out in impressive detail Pound and Eliot's um, ability to negotiate the train of both periodical and book publication options um, to bring in substantial economic and cultural capital for Eliot's um, modernist poem, which was, of course, then styled the modernist masterpiece. The pair considered three journals for initial publication of the poem. This I just pulled right out of out of Rainey's book. So Little Review, prestigious, very small circulation uh, magazine, total circulation of about 3,100 in 1922. Uh, the one to ten ratio of advertising revenue to circulation revenue, and there was this the 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 advertising revenue model of the commercial mass market periodicals was not something Little Review could pull off. Um, the Dial was also a significant publisher of modernist work. It wasn't known for a, a, a serial like Ulysses, like the Little Review had, but it had um, um, 9,500 subscribers and a, a one to three ratio of ads to circulation, plus massive patronage behind it, which I'll come back to in a second. And then finally, they also considered the far larger publisher of modernism for the tired businessman, Vanity Fair, with uh, 96 6,500 subscribers and a 1 to 0.7 ratio of ad to circulation revenues. And there's, this was a magazine that was sustaining itself on, on ad revenues. It brought in more that way than it did in, in circulation. Um, and so, as everybody in this room probably knows, the final deal saw the way Sam published in the dial. Um, they engineered sight unseen that Elliot would win the dial prize that year, which is $2,000. That's depending on how you calculate um, spending power. That's anywhere between thirty or $40,000 and over $500,000. Um, it's, it's actually very hard for economic historians to say what, what a historic dollar is worth, but it was enough money for Elliot to live on for a couple of years easily. Um, and then Horace Liverite agreed to publish the book for him right after it came out in the dial. This was all planned from the beginning. Um, and it allowed, didn't allow the positioning of the wasteland as the, the model of the, and Elliot is the model of the successful modernist poet, accruing both economic and cultural capital. Um, so let me, let me then turn to the, to the big magazine. So it's, it's no coincidence that these revisionist arguments about modernism's relationship to 20th century market economy occur more or less simultaneously with the rise of periodical studies in modernist scholarship in its contemporary form. I'm not talking about Hoffman, Allen, Ulrich, but, um, but unlike in the, the wave of research on little magazines in the wake of Hoffman, Allen, Ulrich's work and the proliferation of reprints in the 50s and 60s, the focus of modern periodical studies is on a wide range of periodicals themselves as the primary objects of study um, and also on a much wider range of periodicals than little magazines. So in other words, this is, this is, the, this is the move to look at periodical publication writ large. Um, and I have to say, that was being done in the 1930s as well, the same year that Pound published his piece in, in, uh, in the NCTE's journal. Uh, the Frank Luther Mott five-volume American Periodicals History started publishing that year, and that was not at all about literary magazines per se or little magazines per se. Um, it was a much, there was a, the grand book in, in Britain was I think the same year, 19, 1930, was starting to look at the history of magazines. Um, but I think I, I don't want to um, suggest that there, that there has been a dropping off of interest in little magazines. In fact, the little magazines and modernism uh, over there on the table, Adam McKibble and Susan, uh, Susan Turchill's book, uh, is a very good example of, of 
contemporary work being done in little magazines. Also, the Journal of Modern Periodical Studies publishes a fair number of pieces on little magazines. Some of them are little magazines that, that you would not have heard of if you were looking at the bibliographies and things that were being printed earlier. Um, but as the, as the growing wave of scholarship exemplified by today's symposium uh, amply demonstrates, um, not just little magazines, whatever that term has been taken to signify, but rather the broader range of modernist era periodicals are necessary for us to more fully understand modernism's relationships and contributions to 20th and 21st century culture. Periodicals of many varieties have been productively examined through the lens of, of modernist studies, from um, Patrick Collier's insightful account of modernism in the newspapers. Um, it's called Modernism on Fleet Street. It came out about a decade ago. David Earle's Recovering Modernism, Pulse Paperbacks and the Prejudice of Form. Um, his all-man all Hemingway, the 1950s, Men's Magazines and the Masculine Persona. Um, Carrie Snyder, Faith Binks, and others have done a lot of work on, on uh, women's magazines. And Faye Hamill, Mark Hesse's uh, uh, new book on modernism's print culture it actually draws a lot of this together in a way that, that gives a, a much, um, much more coherent picture of the scholarship that's being done. So kudos to you for that. Um, so this, this development then raises an important question, I think, about the focus on modernist little magazines um, in this new turn. It, if the relationship of modernism to a, a market and technology-driven print culture is the, the key research aim or is a key research aim, then why not shift massively toward a focus on big magazines? Because that, that's where that question is perhaps more um, completely answerable in the broader sweep than in than looking at a very narrow range of magazines in a very narrow range of years. Um, so while Elliot and Pam were contemplating whether the Condé Nast magazine Vanity Fair, with its emphasis on modernist visual culture and its large circulation, was appropriate for the Wasteland Scribners, uh, which also published a lot of modernist work, could reach circulations of over 200,000 for some issues. But even Scribners couldn't keep up with the slicks. It dies in, in 1939, um, and it, uh, um, it, it basically took a, a massive shift in the magazines that survived the Great Depression um, to see where to see where modernism heads after uh, in, in the war, and this is where um, Donald Harris is on Company Time, which is off the, over the table, actually does a, a really good job of opening up that territory. I'm sorry, he wasn't able to come to this conference. I think he would have had a lot to to say about this, but. Um, Harris looks at, at 1922 as certainly the honest mirabilis of modernism and um, the kind of height of high moment of cultural importance. But, but he goes on, quote, when one looks quantitatively at Eliot's appearance in time, in the magazine time, the historical location of his dominance looks a little different. From 1923 to 1960, Eliot is mentioned in 420 articles. But between its first issue in 1923 and 1929, Time only mentions him five times. And there's, if we think of Eliot as this great figure of the, of the 20s, um, Time tells a, a different story. In fact, Eliot's peak does not occur until after World War II, when between 1950 and 54, he's mentioned more than 100 times. In 1950, he appeared in the magazine at least once every two weeks. As Harris shows, Henry Luce's magazines became the most profitable in the world, surviving a period when many magazines folded during the Great Depression. Um, so Time and, and Life, his other, well, actually he published all sorts of magazines that are, that are still around, um, uh, unquestionably stood on, on top of the American print marketplace. So in its first year, in 1937, Life reached a circulation of 1.5 million per week, which was more than triple the highest circulation of a first year of a magazine in American history up until that point. Um, it had reached 4 million by 1942, over 5.5 million by 1952, um, and time, time in life, well, and, and that's and probably something like 17 million so-called pass-through readers in its first year. Notice somebody buys a magazine, they're not the only person that reads it. Um, I actually could not tell you how people estimate pass-through readership, but that was the, the, the assumption at the time was that it was being read by some 17 million people. Um, Okay, so, so Time and Life both devoted a great deal of attention to Eliot, who, as I mentioned before, won the Nobel in 1948. Um, and as Harris shows, the Time especially essentially repatriated Eliot as an American poet. I mean, no, he was still a, a British citizen, but he became an American poet um, for, for Time's readership. Um, 
And it drew a vision of Eliot and of the wasteland into Time's own project of, of the post-war period. And quote, they both describe the contemporary scene in more accurate and efficient language. Modernist poetry no longer withholds meanings or forces the audience to read difficult texts. Instead, it is exactly like time, aggregating disparate types of knowledge into a uniform, accessible literary voice. And so for Henry Luce, this is the project of the American century. Um, so Eliot now becomes the poet of the American century, um, and Americans abroad are, are basically an expansion of American cultural influence into, into international markets. And I made that ridiculously too small, but if you, could, if you could see that better, you can see basically a bunch of images from the wasteland behind Elliot. There's the chalice, there's, there's the wasteland, there's the water. This is all, uh, it's, it's an effort to basically turn the wasteland into a magazine cover. Um, Essentially, mid-century American culture celebrated modernism in literature, architecture, design, and art, and it did so through the big magazines, at least what Harris is, is calling big magazines. So keeping in mind how Hoffman, Allen, and Ulrich defined the little magazine in terms of its rejection of the commercial market um, and of the professional and promotional culture of the literary establishment, here's how Harris defines the big magazine in the study. And I think this is, this is something that we, we don't have to all agree on what we're going to call the big magazine, but at least have some sense that there are a whole lot of different contender for, for that title. Uh, okay, so this is what Harris says. I use the term big magazine to draw together examples from an eclectic range of periodical genres. The Muckraking Journal, the African American Monthly, the News Magazine, the Photo Magazine, and the Men's Fashion Monthly. What they have in common, beyond the necessary qualification of being unapologetically commercial, is a conscious effort to expand their readerships by way of their textual and visual styles, rather than their content. This style-driven approach was not normally the case in a popular periodical market. So there are a lot of, of large circulating magazines that Harris is not talking about, actually. The, the magazines that he's going to go on to talk about all, all um, drew together what, what might be called a sense of house style um, in a way that, that looks familiar to, to you all now. Um, but the rise of that, that advertising revenue-driven market is something that, um, if you haven't read Richard Oman's Selling Culture, is definitely a good read. Um, there's, there was a, a series of depressions, economic depressions in the United States in the late 19th century that left U.S. production capacity way in advance of, of, of consumption. And those factories could turn out lots of things that nobody was going to buy because nobody had any money. This is the, the classic depression problem. And so what, what Oman's argument is, is the magazines that, that started publication in the, in the, mostly in the 1880s and 1890s organized American consumption around products and began to encourage people to define themselves and their lifestyle in terms of the products they buy. So um, like Ladies Home Journal is a good example of a magazine came out where you have editorial content that ties in with advertising, with product ads on the side. You start getting national um, advertising campaigns for products uh, appearing in, in the pages as well. And so that, that sets the sets the stage for the magazines that, that Harris is talking about. Um, but as Harris puts it, the titles I group under Big Magazine, uh, under the Big Magazine, experiment with the formal possibilities of the periodical, particularly with editorial voice and visual patterns, while still keeping commercial success and enormous readerships at the center of the business model. By, by manipulating distinct aspects of the editorial and aesthetic production of periodicals, they set standards for what today we take for granted as a journal's house style, a notion of aesthetic uniformity that develops over the first half of the 20th century, alongside the transformation of magazines into professional endeavors. And it's, it's not that there weren't large-selling magazines in the 19th century. It's that there, there, is, a, there is a kind of aesthetic um, approach to them that made them more successful and even more widely circulating, which of course also coincides with more cheaply being able to print um, images and, and color, things like that. So in his account, these range from McClure's in the 1890s to the crisis in the 1910s. I think the crisis is the, is the theme of this conference. <laughs> this is a, a lot of papers on the crisis. Time from the 1920s, um, all of which respond to commercial demands with formal solutions. Um, 
So Harris notes that his big magazines, in addition to employing and publishing so many mass cult phobic novelists and poets whom we now consider modernists, these magazines' experiments with the limitations and possibilities of their medium echo the very formal tenets of modernism that popular magazines are often placed in opposition to. In other words, for everybody who's thinking of the little magazine as the modernist magazine par excellence, um, if you look at these big magazines slightly differently, you'll, you'll see some things that look distinctly modernist about their, about their approach. Um, and so magazines like McClure's, The Crisis, Time, Life, and Esquire, um, dual modernism and modernist writers, uh, such as Fitzgerald, Hemingway, Cather gets a lot of, of press. Um, and they drew them into the professional folds of American periodical culture in ways that the little magazine simply could not. Um, so the category of the big magazines then offers an a alternative model to that of the little magazines, but it also speaks to other less aggressively insular periodical forms, such as the 19th century quality magazines and the general interest or family home magazines that emerged in the 1890s and early 1900s. And there is, this is, you need, to, you need to know something about the broader sweep of American periodical culture for all this to make sense, but there's a big place for modernism in it as opposed to the thing that modernism was trying to, trying to get around or to evade. So such a focus in periodical studies necessarily adds a category to the commonly discussed high and low in relationship to modernism, and that's the category of middle brow. Um, a number of scholars, including, of course, Faye Hamill, uh, have done an extensive amount of work on middle brow culture, and as Catherine Kaiser notes, the, the term middle brow referred perhaps more clearly to mass market venues and middle class audiences than the formal characteristics of literary style. Um, so magazines such as Vanity Fair and The New Yorker could serve as examples of American middle brow. Um, magazines that popularized the innovations of literary and artistic modernism, even as they promoted bourgeois status and consumer pleasure. So um, Louise Giant uh, notes that middle brow began to appear as a term in Britain in the 1920s. Um, and with Punch, y'all know Punch, the humor magazine, that the, the, this is the best definition of middle brow ever. As Punch put it, it consists of people who are hoping that someday they will get used to the stuff they ought to like. <laughs> um, so exploring the making of middle brow canon in American literature, uh, Jayant explains that instead of structuring the cultural landscape in terms of hierarchy, American critics imagine a variety of cultural subfields that share similar characteristics. For example, Dashiell Hammett's The Maltese Falcon was often compared to the work of Ernest Hemingway and other modernist writers. In other words, these, these could be talked about in the same breath and seem like they're of a piece, even though uh, literary, um, academic literary historians might have, have missed that connection. Uh, oh yeah, these, these are the magazines uh, that Harris is, is uh, focusing on primarily. And I, I happen to pick ones that all have people on the covers, but, but if you looked at you know 40 different issues of each of these magazines, you, you could perceive that there is a style to this. There, there is a lot of thought that, that went into it. Okay, so Powell was surely correct in his 1930 article in Small Magazines to insist that, quote, literature evolves via a mixture of two methods. And so what he had in mind was the experimental impulse of what he was calling fugitive magazines and the more um, publicly accessible commercial magazines. Exploring modernism in relationship to big magazines opens up a more nuanced understanding of its role in the print culture of both the early 20th century as modernism took root in America and the mid 20th century when it had become validated by literary prizes and become a significant component of middle brow culture. So Hoffman ignores that last part of Pound's claim that these two aspects of periodical culture go hand in hand. It's not that modernism escapes the commercial mass market is that, that these modern little magazines play a role in what will eventually become a commercial mass market, and both of those things are necessary. Modernists want to be able to afford to put food on their table. Um, so let me leave you with three key areas of contemporary uh, critical approaches to, to modernist magazines, big and little. Um, Okay, so first is an approach to the lens of, of the study of technologized media. And I would certainly credit um, Ann Artis and Patrick Collier's uh, 2011 symposium at the University of Delaware, which I know a lot of you were at, Media Morphosis, Print Culture and Transatlantic Public Spheres, 1890 to 1940, for, for asking us to defamiliarize um, modernist magazines by considering them in terms of new media technologies. I think you're, you're doing a similar thing with your children's um, magazines of the, of the 19th century as well. Um, so they're drawing on Roger Fiddler's 
term uh, media morphosis, but basically media theory has kind of crept into this approach. Um, Sean Latham gave a, an excellent um, roundtable talk at MLA in 2013 on affordances and emergence, magazines as new media, um, that laid out the terrain of the argument quite compellingly. Um, so Latham takes as a starting point Friedrich Kittler's thesis that, that film typewriters, phonographs, um, uh, and other media technologies make the early 20th century important because it ushered in the technologizing of information. Um, and I think this is, you don't have to have Kittler to tell you this, I think this is a pretty widely um, held view at this point. Um, but what, uh, what Sean was doing, and, and I know you've, you've looked at this as well, is uh, using uh, concepts from information theory and even software design um, to, to think about how magazines offer greater affordances than the codex can. Um, and there was, there are not a whole lot of ways you can read through a book. You know, if, you, if you're doing it right, you start at the beginning and you just keep reading until you're done. Most people don't just flip around promiscuously in it. But, but a magazine can be read in a whole bunch of different ways. You, you flip around randomly, you can go to specific articles, you can look at the, the pictures and the ads, and there's, there's no one way to read a, a magazine. And so in that sense, it has a, um, a greater affordance than a, than a book does. Um, and so, as Latham points out, the, the difference is not just one of degree, but of kind. And it's precisely this expanded affordance that makes the magazine itself a fundamentally new media form. And just the same way that, say, the phonograph, the film, or early hypertext afforded new kinds of agentive possibilities, so too did the modern magazines. Indeed, we might best understand magazines not as derivatives of the book at all, but as a distinctive array of radically new software designs that operate on the hardware of paper and ink. And his sense is that, that Kittler kind of missed the boat on periodicals because he was just thinking about them as sort of like books, you know, which is an odd omission in Kittler. But he adds to that um, Kate Hales's term emergence, um, which she defines as, quote, any behavior or property that cannot be found in either a system's individual components or their additive properties, but that arises often unpredictably from the interaction of a system's components, which if you're if you read a lot of 20th century philosophy, it's, it's, a, it's a harmonic property, isn't it, is what she's talking about. Um, so uses that to elucidate the specific media experience that arises from the modern magazine. Um, so as Latham puts it, the wide affordances of the magazine produce the conditions for emergence, for the creation of interconnected networks of meaning that are not only difficult to map or anticipate, but that elude stabilizing concepts like author, intention, and even textuality. But then his, his most provocative claim, and I, I want to come back to this in just a second when I end, is um, addresses the modernist nature of the magazine itself. And this new software initiated uh, key elements of the intermedial aesthetic experiments in form, genre, and character we somewhat haplessly call modernism. Okay, so the modern magazine essentially is modernist in a sense, um, even though it takes a, a little bit of looking at it differently to, to see this. Okay, the, the second approach, uh, I'll, I'll skip over that. Um, the second approach is one that's, that's come up actually several times already today, which is using digital research and pedagogical tools. Um, and this is um, in the Skulls and Wolfman book, what they, what they would call rethinking modernist magazines from genres to database, essentially to, quote, move from ideological or cultural constructions to the collection of data that will enable scholars to group magazines in ways that will help answer the questions of interest to them and to search those magazines for appropriate information. Um, so I think probably everyone in the room has played around with the Modernist Journals Project online and see there's a lot of, um, a lot of material on that. When that was created, I think the idea was primarily just about access. These are hard to find, and it's hard to get ones of them that had ads in them. Here's, here's like a library of all these things you can find. Since then, the, the, the ability to use these now digitalized, um, uh, encoded pages to, to do other kinds of research has really become clearly a, a major contribution to the Modernist Journals Project. Um, and so, so this is um, what, what a, a database can offer in, in these terms is a, is a richer set of configurable data than what a bibliographic project like Hoff and Allen and Ulrichs possibly could. They had a certain set of, of terms that they included for each, you know, a certain data set for each magazine included, but that's it. You know, you, you get that and you can look at each magazine in this way. Um, but so, so ultimately, Scholes and, and Wolfman argue that, that um, 
the, 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 the terms little magazine or big magazine don't really represent anything real in the textual world. Um, terms like mass magazine, little magazine, are, are essentially modernist notions that are, that are designated to make high-low distinctions. And so in a way, they've kind of held the scholarship back by requiring these two categories. Um, and so database-driven research then can make much uh, more supple and capacious um, interventions into categories entirely um, and, and give a different direction to the starting point for research. And, and the, the distinction they make is question-driven discovery is, of course, the most common form of research. And that's what most of us do if you go to an archive or you go to a book. And what am I, what am I looking for? What am I trying to, de to determine by reading this book or going to this archive? But it's inverse. Data-driven discovery can be equally useful. Some new category of information or some new way of looking at that information may spark questions one never thought to ask before. And there is the, the, the kind of... Um, the kind of distinction in the, the um, topic modeling thing, going through and having your categories plugged in and lo and behold, finding them versus just letting, letting the topics generate themselves. This is, the, this is the, in a way, the distinction. And I think there'll be a lot, um, there'll be a lot of surprising things that we, we find by doing the, the kind of topic modeling that, you, that you've been doing, Bill. Um, and then finally, um, I, I want to come to uh, another kind of contrarian argument, which is by um, Patrick Collier in, in Modern Print Artifacts, which is basically it's time to leave behind modernism. Um, and I don't mean modernist literature and the things that we've all made careers out of working on, but, but having that be the operative term for what we're doing. Um, and his sense is that it basically constrains a broader understanding of the highly innovative print culture of the period. Um, so he's pushing back against Charlie Altieri's recent complaint that the new modernisms have, uh, have expanded the field too broadly um, and too far outside of literature itself. Collier writes, Altieri's polemic is entitled How the New Modernist Studies Fails the Old Modernism. I am more interested in how, how modernist studies, old and new, have failed the early 20th century. Um, it's a good thing we don't have Charlie Altieri in the room. He would not like that. But what I, just to, to wrap all this up, um, the technological slash media-driven explorations like, like the one Sean Latham laid out um, certainly shows us why uh, periodicals are, are important. It's the kind of new media that, that you're looking at in the, in, the, in the 19th century as well. But also make arguments um, about, the, about modernist aesthetics in relationship to um, the forms of experience afforded by modern period, periodical culture. Um, but I, I leave with Patrick Collier's question of whether the term modernism should remain the motivating category in our research. Um, and I'm hoping that a turn of big magazines can answer that. Or if modernism remains, um, if, if we lose modernism as the focus, do we risk losing sight of the distinctive contributions of little magazines by submerging them in a larger field of, of periodical studies. Um, and I have to say, I'm, I'm agnostic on this one. I can kind of see value of, of, of both. But I look forward to hearing your research, because I think you guys are all working on this on the same project. Thank you. Thank you.